Right, I'm talking about global mercury monitoring requirements. Um, you can see that I work for Uniper. Um, we're an international energy company with a, about 12,000 employees distributed as per the graph below. Um, we have power plants, trading activities and service provision within the portfolio. And we've been around for about five years. So originally formed as a D merger from the E.ON group. Um, that's a list of our operations again and graphically at the bottom in a bit more detail we've got about 35 gigawatts of generation capacity spread across gas-fired coal-fired plants um, also hydro hydroelectric and nuclear and uh, we've got a lot of gas infrastructure there as you can see and growth areas for us are now hydrogen and renewables in terms of our service offering we've traditionally offered across the full range of disciplines you see at the bottom there and across the whole life plant, whole life cycle of the plant, so from initial specification through to decommissioning. Of course, we're focusing on environmental assessment this, this afternoon. So on to the topic then. I'm going to begin by talking about uh, regulation of SEMS in Europe and then cross-comparing with the US later on to give it more of a global feel. Um, in Europe, it's the main quality assurance standard is 14181. Um, it talks about automated measuring systems or AMS so whenever you see that it means SEMS it defines quality assurance levels or quals and you can see in the graphic uh, where these different levels fall within the sort of installation and calibration process and in, this is supplemented for mercury by EN 14884 which is under revision and we can see the operator's responsibilities along the right hand side there. So we have to install compliant equipment under Qual 1. Uh, we have to calibrate that equipment in situ uh, under Qual 2. So we get an accredited test lab to site. They take some measurements using a standard reference method and, and calibrate the AMS in that way. Um, they come back every year to check that the calibration is still sound. Um, and then the operator has to perform ongoing quality assurance based, based on regular zero and span checks under Qual 3. There's various documentation requirements. And I'll just point out that you, you get a valid calibration range for the system from the Qual 2 process. And if your plant emissions go above that level uh, for a significant amount of time, you have to repeat the calibration Um, this last point on here really emphasizes the importance of internal calibration. So we have a, the, the, the AMS are calibrated by the test house using an SRM, but of course each of those has its own internal calibration relating to a reference material. So the AMS is perhaps less important in a way because whatever error sits, sits in Qual 1 is calibrated out to a large extent uh, by the SRM. But the SRM has its own sort of calibration reference that needs to be taken into account. So traceability is very important. So let's think a moment about Qual 1, um, which is effectively done pre-installation. This is type testing, typically by TUV in Germany, uh, to EN 15267. We've got a copy of the certificate here. It's important to realize that mercury analyzers measure elemental mercury only. Um, the actual emission comprises elemental and oxidized mercury, mostly mercury chloride. So in order to get the total mercury, the instrument has to have a converter which um, converts the mercury chloride back to elemental mercury so that the total can be measured. So that's a sort of a fundamental piece of information you need to, to know. Um, all quality assurance assessment is based on the daily emission limit value. Um, there are arguments why it shouldn't be, but that is the position at the moment. The maximum permissible uncertainty allowed for the monitoring is 40% of the daily ELV for mercury. And for certification purposes, the instrument has to do better than that at the point of certification. So it's three quarters of that, um, that maximum uncertainty, so it's 30% of the daily limit value in effect. So a few key points on certification. Um, 
the measurement and certainty on the certificate determines the lowest limit value to which that instrument can be applied. Um, certification is based on laboratory testing and field testing of two duplicate instruments. And the measurement and certainty is determined from the test results. So it's based on the linearity results, the lack of fit across the concentration range, cross sensitivity to other components within the gas matrix, especially SO2 in the case of mercury, uh, zero and span drift across a period of time. That's taken from the field trial. And um, in terms of internal adjustment of the AMS, that can be at any frequency, as long as it's not too frequent, and it can use any approach. So it can use elemental mercury uh, or a mercury chloride gener generator or and or, um, and it can be of any type. But when it comes to certification, all of the checking is done with a mercury chloride generator. Um, but in terms of um, checking qual three performance uh, every three months, maybe, and also checking the span level. Um, reproducibility is counted in. So this is the difference in the readings between the two instruments when they're on the same stack. Um, if the repeatability of a single instrument was higher than the, that difference, then that would be used instead. It's the bigger of the two numbers. We've got the influence of the ambient temperature of the span concentration, the influence of the supply voltage, the influence of the sample gas flow rate, and the reference material uncertainty is counted in here at 70% of the concentration at 70% of range. Um, that's assumed to be 2% uh, based on a, a sort of a bottom up assessment of the mercury generator, but in reality it could be higher than that. So you can see this is pretty comprehensive, and at the end of the day, you get a, a, a microgram per meter cubed uncertainty value on the certificate that has to be less than 30% of the daily limit value. Coming on to quality assurance level two, qual two, um, I've mentioned that's a linear calibration. You can see that we've got the SRM test results on the Y axis, the plant monitor results on the X axis. Uh, not, a, not a brilliant um, set of results this, there are better ones, but you know, there are a, a lot around like this. Now, this is for a coal powered power plant. Uh, the emission is mostly ele elemental mercury. And you can see um, the range four to eight microgram per meter cubed in this case. And the standard deviation of differences between each of those test points and the calibration line is about two microgram per meter cubed. You can see that at the top of the plot. This is the, the test points are sort of 15 samples across three days of operation, um, about 30, 30 to 60 minute duration. So a few key points here, the valid calibration range for the system is only 10% higher than the maximum measured concentration, or you can ex use reference materials to extend that, mercury chloride only at the moment. Um, the data analysis approach depends on the range, the min-max range. So if, if that's less than 40% of the limit, and the minimum concentration is less than 15% of the limit, um, then the span and zero values can be used to improve the calibration. And improve is in quotes there because it may not improve it. Um, in this particular case, there's a span value of 30 microgram per meter cube included. Um, and if you remove that, you get a better correlation, in fact. And I won't go into the reasons for that. That can be a dangerous thing to do. So the variability of the data, the data scatter, it's the standard deviation of differences between the Y values and the calibration line, effectively. Uh, and call to is all about variability data scatter. There's no requirement to check the absolute difference between the SRM and the AMS, you just apply a factor. So the, the SRM may be 50% higher, you need to apply a factor of 1.5. This in my view is a big weakness, um, although anybody worth the salt would be checking why there was a big difference uh, in the first place. 
try and sort that out before proceeding. But the whole emphasis is on the data scatter. So the variability test requires that that standard deviation is less than about 20% of the limit value. And there's no bias test. I've mentioned that you just apply a factor since the SRM is assumed to be without bias. But of course, there are systematic uncertainties in reality. And the SRM calibration uncertainty does dominate the, the overall monitoring uncertainty. Functional tests have to be performed. Um, it shouldn't say after that, it's before each Qual2 or AST. And they're detailed in the table below. Um, performed within one month of testing. Uh, the zero, there's a zero and span check required, but no pass tolerance is specified. At least not in the standard. Some regulations do that. Um, a five, five concentration level linearity test is required. Uh, the interference test is listed, but it's not usually performed. It would only, that would only be done if the plant concentrations were way outside of the limits tested during certification. And the test laboratory audits the previous year's drift data from the instruments from the weekly clear and span checks. And there's a response time test in various housekeeping activities. And then the test team comes back every year to um, this. This is a different plant. It's not the original Qual2 calibration line, but it's an example of an AST. And it just sort of illustrate this. Um, it's fewer points, so it's five points across one day of operation. In this particular case, you can see there's a group of points around four microgram per meter cube that agree with the line pretty well. And then a couple a bit higher up that are less in agreement. Um, the valid calibration range can be extended using ST data if you've got higher concentrations. Um, the variability test is relaxed. Uh, there is a bias test this time because you want to know if the new set of points is is a drift from the original calibration. If they're too far away from it, it's a sign that the, calib the underlying calibration has drifted, changed. And that bias test, the average difference has to be less than 20% of the ERV. So this is the difference between the points and the new points and the original calibration line. Um, and that, that's the case when the variability is small. If the variability is large, then that could be as high as 45% of the limit for mercury. So a poorly performing AMS or a poorly performing SRM is rewarded with a relaxed tolerance. Um, which has always seemed a bit baffling to me. Quality assurance level three. Um, this is a, a regular zero and span check. The standard doesn't specify how frequently it should be done. Um, operators like to do it a bit more frequently than the minimum, uh, just so that they, in case they have a problem, because they don't want to have a, a big gap in their data. And it's a control chart approach. So, for example, this simple Schuert chart. Um, this isn't for Mercury, but it, but it illustrates the approach. So you've got a zero chart there. Uh, you can see the blue uh, points are the drift away from zero, plotted against time over quite a long time scale, and that shows excellent performance. You've got yellow warning limits and red alarm limits. Um, the control chart limits can be set as a proportion of the daily limit value again. And there's a, a span chart just for illustration. Um, you can see in this case that there was some drift within, within the limits. And about halfway through that time series, it was corrected. So obviously, the span check requires a stable reference material. Um, either an external mercury generator or something integrated. And it currently needs to be a, a hovercal or, or similar. So it's a mercury chloride device. 
this means that the converter efficiency um, that converts mercury chloride back to elemental, the elemental form that can potentially cause drift if that if that's going off. And the alarm limit is effectively an action limit. So if it reaches the alarm limit, you have to take corrective action and do something about it. Um, if you hit the warning limit, you should certainly consider taking action. But rules around this do vary considerably between member states. As an alternative, data can be held within the AMS, within the instrument, um, and that can just generate an alarm when it's out of tolerance. And you can see that the emphasis is placed on allowing the instrument to drift within a tolerance rather than imposing a regular uh, cali internal calibration. I said that most of the instruments do perform some, some form of internal calibration and that's allowed under, under Qual 1. So that's a sort of whistle-stop tour through the European regulations um, and as they apply to mercury. Um, I'll just cross-compare with the US now as best I can. Um, this is an overview slide and then I'll go into a little bit more detail for each of the uh, components. We've already talked about 14181, Core 1 certification. Um, the nearest equivalent to that in the States is something called the Environmental Technology Verification Program, or ETV. Um, that is mostly based on field trials and it's mostly based on comparison with a reference method using a relative accuracy test audit or RATA. This is effectively very similar to a Qual 2 that I've described. So Qual 2 calibration is 15 test points across three days. The RATA is called a certification, which is confusing in terminology, um, but that's a nine point test series on site. Uh, we mentioned functional tests that have to be done on the instruments before the calibration. Um, well, lots of tests are defined in US EPA performance standards. The Qual 2 is a linear calibration versus a standard reference method. So you get a gradient and an offset that you apply to the AMS. And you've also got this measure of the data scatter, the variability. Um, the RATA um, is also a linear comparison with a reference method. There are a number. And, um, you're looking for the relative accuracy of the AMS SEMS compared with the reference method. Um, and a bias adjustment factor may, may then be applied to the instruments. So in a way, that's similar to applying calibration factors. And then the ongoing control in the US, um, it's daily zero and span checks. For the AST, um, that's, that has a bias test in it effectively, uh, as does the RATA. So the RATA is repeated, might be more frequently than annually, depending on the plant type and the regulation. So that, that's an overview. Um, in terms of Qual 1, I think I'll more or less skip through this because ETV is more or less in abeyance. The last report was produced years ago, and that's because it's non-mandatory. It's a voluntary system as opposed to the mandatory uh, requirement in Europe. Um, so in Europe, you'd get a certificate with the performance characteristics and an expanded uncertainty. And for the current mercury analyzer offerings, that ranges from 0.3 to 3.2 microgram per meter cube, so a factor of 10. Um, it's done according to that particular standard. Um, ETV was, is based on various rev verification protocols and test plans. Um, but it does look at some of the same performance characteristics and does require um, a RATA to be performed. Pressing the wrong button here. So I won't go into uh, any more detail on that because ETV is, is, is not really used anymore. When we come to comparison between the Qual 2 and the RATA, 
Well, first of all, the functional tests. So there's a response time test. The instrument has to get to 90% of the expected concentration within 240 seconds. Um, in the US, there is, there's a cycle time test, which is at two concentrations, low, low and high, up and down scale, using elemental mercury rather than oxidized mercury. And that's a 15 minute requirement. Um, in the US, a, a linearity check is done with elemental mercury, three concentration levels with three repeats. And the acceptance criterion is within 5% for all, for all points. Um, in Europe, there is a linearity check, but it's with mercury chloride. And there is a, an integrity check in the States, which is the same as a linearity check, but it uses mercury chloride instead. So they're going a step further there. Um, I would say the linearity check is easy to pass in the in the in Europe as well. In the US, a seven-day drift test is required using either elemental or oxidized mercury. Um, in Europe, it's essentially an audit. It's the Qual three process plus an, an annual audit of that process. And then, in terms of the Qual two calibration itself, or, or the RATA in the US, the reference method over there, you can. There is a choice in reference methods. Um, originally, it was the Ontario Hydro method, which is the wet chemistry approach, um, suitable for that concentration range, or method twenty nine. Um, in Europe, it's 13211, wet chemistry method, which in the standard, it has a rather high limit of detection and reproducibility. So it's two and a half microgram per meter cubed for 30 minute sampling. That can obviously be optimized substantially by extended sampling and better analysis and by tighter control on the, the method. But it does need revalidation for, for mercury concentrations below four. I think that's pretty widely accepted and there's work ongoing in that area. Um, the favoured approach in the States is to use a sorbon trap method um, for checking the SEMS. Um, IRM is in instrumental reference method, so you can use an analyzer as well, but it's more involved. So the favourite is sorbon traps, and that is a more sensitive approach. You can see it goes down to 0.1 microgram per meter cubed. But in theory, we've got the same approach in Europe, we have a technical specification that's been developed, uh, essentially the same approach, but it is as yet unvalidated in Europe, which is preventing its routine use. So a regulator can can approve it in a specific situation, um, but it's, it's not available routinely for compliance assessment. Um, I mentioned the variability tests. This looks at the data scatter, standard deviation of differences. Um, there's, there's no such thing in, in the RATA. Uh, the relative accuracy test that's in the RATA um, isn't present in the QUAL2. Um, but when we get to the AST, we, I mentioned that there is that absolute difference check between the, the new data and the old calibration. So that is a bias check of sorts. And the, the relative accuracy test in the States, um, you can see how it's defined there. It's, it's the mean difference plus a co confidence coefficient divided by the mean concentration. Um, that has to be less than 20%. So a similar tolerance um, when you're above two and a half microgram per meter cubed. If you're below that, it becomes very difficult. So there's an absolute value there for, for low concentrations as an alternative, which isn't, isn't yet defined in Europe, but is probably coming. Europe, there's no bias test uh, in the RAS, there is. So every time it's performed, you're checking to see if the mean difference between the test and the, the SEMS is, is greater than um, a confidence coefficient. And if it is, you, ap you apply a factor to account for the difference. But only if the, the reference method is bigger than the SEMS result. If the SEMS is higher than the reference method, you just leave it be 
because it's 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 conservatively high. Um, you only apply it if it's if it's the reference method is higher than the sense. So there's a slight difference in approach there. When it comes to qual three, um, regular zero and span checks, we've talked about the European system. I won't go into it. Any more detail, you can use a built in procedure within the analyzer, uh, and that has various requirements associated with it. And you can base the control chart limits on the instrument uncertainty itself, or more commonly, the emission limit value. Um, it's a bit of a different system in the States. You've got uh, a daily zero and span challenge using a NIST traceable mercury generator. And you can see the triangle of traceability at the bottom there. It enables the generator on site to be traced back to the NIST prime. Um, and that has to be done on a fairly, fairly frequent basis. It, the frequency can be reduced if you've got a built-in permeation source to check your generator. There's a weekly integrity check using mercury chloride and a quarterly linearity check at the three concentration levels, QGA. So in conclusion then, the QA procedures are, very, are superficially similar between the EU and the US, but there are important differences. Um, the EU requires type testing with a focus on measurement uncertainty. Um, the on-site proving is similar with regards to performance tests and comparison of the AMS with a reference method. Uh, but the EU requires a linear calibration against the SRM in all circumstances. And I would say there's an over-reliance on using the daily limit as the benchmark and using mercury chloride reference materials alone for the assessment. The US requires certification against the reference method um, and a bias adjustment of factors applied, as I've said, only if the AMS is lower than the reference method. But the internal mercury generators must also be certified. And in the EU, EU the wet chemistry SRM uh, does require revalidation and further development at low concentrations. And it's really important that the sorbent trap method is fully validated in Europe uh, because it offers a number of advantages. And traceability in all of this has a, a major role to play um, in assuring the quality and the underlying uncertainty of, of every aspect of that chain. Um, I'm flicking to these because I think you're only going to have the video recording afterwards. So I'll pause for a few seconds on each one so you can frame grab it if you want. But if anybody wants a copy of the PDF, let me know. So that's EU, that was the EU references. This is the US references, which I'll leave up on the screen for a moment. Um, that's a pre-lockdown photograph. If I don't look 10 years older, I feel it. As probably we all do. <laughs> but my contact details are there, so do feel free to get in touch.